Today in Ireland, the Irish clothing industry is worth 5 billion euro, nearly all of which is imported. However, this was not always the case. During the 1940s and 50s, Ireland was producing its own clothing and footwear, not only for its own market, but also for export. Here in Milton Melbe, there was a thriving clothing factory called Melbe Manufacturing Limited. Due to the rise of cheap foreign imports, mainly from Asia, this company closed in the mid-80s. This is the story of Melbe Manufacturing and Dell Cash labels. Hi, Mary. How are you doing? Good. Uh, my name is David. This is Grace. Uh, we just want to ask you some questions about the time you worked in the knit factory okay. in Milton Melba. Well, first and foremost, I worked there for about 47 years. Uh, the factory started first in 1937 in a premises on the main street in Milton with a few machines. And then after a year or two, it went to another premises in the main street, Malone's. Then in 1940, it came up to the Blair Road, where that present building is, where Kenny's are now, Kenny's shop, in 1940. Now, when I started working in the factory force in 1945, things were very backward, because everything was done by hand. When I went in there first, I tacked on a strapping on a cardigan so that the overlocker could overlock it on straight. But as time went on, that improved, that method improved. Now, all knitting was done in a hand knitting machine, and the girl that did it stood all day for eight hours a day, and the pieces were pre-pressed with an iron, a steam iron, and before they were cut and overlocked. Then there was, there was a great system there, all the girls would be sitting on a row and nobody was allowed to be talking during work, so they all started singing. <laughs> so they all had the same song and they'd all be singing. So that went on. Um, a lot of the employees, the man that started the factory first was um, Dr. Michael Hillary from Spanish Point, who is father of the late president. Uh, Barney O'Driscoll, who is Deborah's grandfather, a businessman from Nina, and a father McKenna that we had as a priest in Milton. And it was they started the business going first. Now the first wage that I ever got there was one pound fifty a week. And how old were you then? I was fifteen. And when I got three fifty a week I thought I won the lotto. <laughs> um then uh, when they came into that building across the road, they in, uh, bought in machines, automatic machines, from England. With the result, as you can see there in the photographs, there was no hand knitting anymore. Then they got the, a winder, which the yarn used to come in in, in hanks, and the yarn was wound into cones for the machines. Then they got a steam presser, which pressed the garments. And that all, like, how things changed over the years. Then they got a music system that was operated from the office. And you walk while you play music. We worked eight hours a day, five days a week and a half day Saturday, 45 hours a week. We worked, we worked no church holidays at that stage. And uh, I suppose in the 1960s, the church holiday went, and everybody worked church holidays. We got off bank holidays. Now, the, the amount of workers, boys and girls, gradually grew from about 40 to about 100. And that hundred people were mostly all local people. Uh, there were three buses on the road bringing in the people uh, from Dunbeg, Mullock and Innes Diamond. And that bus would collect them in the morning and bring them back home in the evening. Um, How did you travel to work then? A bicycle. A bicycle? Yeah. I only lived a mile out the road, a, a bicycle. Now, it was, there was great atmosphere there. Everybody liked work. Everybody was so lucky to get work at that time. There was no work. 
And like that was a marvellous boom for Milltown to have a factory of that uh, amount of people there. Now, there was a shop just down the road there, uh, Raymond Ward lives in it now. She was an older lady and she made a living out of the factory because you had a 10 minute break at 11 o'clock and nobody could go down the town because they'd be late coming up. So they all went into her and they bought biscuits and sweets and uh, cigarettes and everything and she made her living out of the factory. And uh, what exactly do you used to make? Uh, ladies' cardigans, ladies' jumpers, uh, men's children's stuff, children's dresses, all knitwear. And um, various different operations. I went then from tacking uh, on to overlocking. Now, overlocking was a quite hard job. It took you six to eight weeks to train. And we used to send girls in to a false place in Shannon and they would train them. Now, overlocking was the main job there. As years went by then and girls would get married and if she was a trained overlocker, she would be given a machine in her own home and she was paid by the garment. And she used to make money at home. And there was a lot of money made at home around the town of people be finishing garments and that. And uh, we, one of the bus drivers would deliver the stuff and collect it. Deborah, when did the labels come in? The labels came in about 1954, 1955 as a direction from Dunn Stores were one of the major customers of the knitwear factory and old Ben Don wanted a woven label that said St Bernard. He was copying Marks and Spencer's in St Michael and he wanted something traditional. So Dalkesh was formed from that and was the only woven factory in Ireland at the time. They supplied labels all over the world. They were designed by a German, a German man in the beginning. Kuschenmeister was the manager. And over time, the factory evolved to be taken over eventually by Beresford's a lace factory. But they continued, the Dalkash labels continued right up to 2004, I think. Yeah. But for years, the people then started going to printed labels. They didn't, they didn't want the idea of the old woven label that was expensive to make, but they used to make uh, calendars and bookmarks and that. And you'll still see some in old haberdashery shops, you'll still see caches of cork. And they would have been, at one time, originated across the road in Dalkesh labels as well. So Mary, can you tell me what happened up to the closure of the factory? Well, when we were implying 100 people there, we even had to do overtime to come able to um, get out the orders in time. They were going to Holland, to Poland, everywhere. Years went by then and they started make, importing cheap stuff in from China and all that places. And there is no way could you compete with that. Like you, can, you could buy in stuff from China for two or three pounds. You couldn't compete with that here. And that had a devastating effect on us. So we couldn't get the orders. Johns were buying in from foreign companies. So we had no choice but to close, and the workers were devastated. It was a shock to the town, an awful shock to the town, because with three vans on the road, uh, the garages got petrol, uh, the shops, books, magazines, cakes, everything. It had a terrible effect in the town. Some of the workers went away to England, then about three or four years after that happening, um, Kenny Brothers and Le Hinch decided they'd open a small knitwear factory. And it was in the similar lines. And they bought in new machinery and they employed a lot of the workers that worked in the Malabay. But the same thing happened to them. After seven or eight years, the same and thing happened. No market, close. it had to close. So that was the end of industry in Milltown. What shops did the factory supply to? In, in Ireland, well, John's Stores was a great um, outlet for us for our knitwear and also pennies. But you could not mix them. Supposing John's Stores got a garment with pennies label on it, whoever was responsible in the factory would get the sack. It was a mortal thing. 
because pennies didn't know duns were getting them, duns didn't know get, were getting them. But dun stores were great, they were marvellous now. And um, many times during the years, old Ben Dunn, young Ben Dunn visited the factory. And they were, then there was other private, little company, private shops that used to buy them. Some of the local shops in Milltown used to buy them, in Innes. And at one stage we made um, blouses for the Aer Lingus hostesses in Shannon. So then Deborah will fill in in the shops across the channel. If we supplied Top Shop, Dorothy Park and British Home stores, they were only in England at the time. None of those stores had opened in Ireland and didn't open until the late 80s. Then Macy's in the States was one of our biggest customers. They, they took all the iron type sweaters and the heavy, heavy duty out, outerwear as they called it. And some of the garments, Kors Thruktola, which was the Irish Export Board, were of great help at the time. We exported some to Japan in yeah. the last few days and to Italy as well, which would be noted as being the home of knitwear. In fact, there was one instance where my father tried to sell a certain sweater to a shop in Nina and the lady said, oh, I don't buy anything Irish. And three months later, he happened to be in Nina and the lady had bought the same shop, the same sweater from a an outlet in London that she could have bought in Milltown Malway and would have sold for an awful lot cheaper than what she was selling it for. So Mary, can you tell me about the changes that happened in Milltown since the factory closed? Oh yes, there was a lot of changes. Like first and foremost, there was no employment whatsoever and a lot of them had to immigrate. Even local workers in Milltown had to go to Shannon and Limerick to work. Now, at that time that the knitwear factory closed, there were other knitwear factories in Ireland. But I believe now there's no knitwear factory in Ireland. All imported in, and that was a terrible loss. You know, a terrible loss, and a loss to the town, a loss to the people that worked there. But the result immigration took a terrible hold. So Mary, can you tell me about the conditions you worked in when you worked in the factory? Oh, they were excellent. Everybody was very happy there. We had a canteen there and we would get 11 o'clock break, as I mentioned before. Everybody would have tea and biscuits at their own expense, like. Uh, they could have their lunch there because some of them was three or four miles away. Then at Christmas, there would be a social organised a dinner dance and to be all held in a local hotel in Milltown. And all the workers and their husbands or their boyfriends or girlfriends would go there. An excellent place, a very, very happy place. There was no union there until very, very late in, time, in the, at the time. An excellent place to work. So Mary, can you tell me, how did you manage to juggle bringing up a family and working in the factory? Well, I had to live in a girl, girl that minded the children. She lived in the house. And fine, I used to start work at nine in the morning and finish at six. But she lived in and I do whatever bit of work I had with her in the evening. At that time, things were way easier than they are now. I'd say it would be way harder. That time you see children walk to school or whatever and no driving. I never drove a car in my life. Mary, how many weeks holiday did you get in the factory? We got two weeks, the last two weeks of July, every year and a week at Christmas. And two weeks paid holidays and that time we got church holidays, but that was fine. Everybody took, some of them went away on holidays. I used to go to England sometimes on holidays when my children got bigger. They went to England working and I went to England on holidays. Then sometimes I would have to bring over samples to Dorothy Perkins and Topshop and then for Noel, Noel Otterskill. And everybody enjoyed the holidays. And um, looking forward to summer holidays always. There was a time when it was really hot summer one year. Do you remember that? And the hours of work changed because the days were so hot that people it, weren't able yeah. to work in the afternoon. So people They'd came into in work very early. About very six. early. So that that things so were hot, always yeah. accommodated. If somebody yeah. needed to go cut their turf, they could take, get somebody to cover for them. There, there were a lot of farmers there who were there working. There was, yeah, yeah. And they took mm. the time that was necessary. We had one man who used to, every time his wife had a baby, he suffered morning sickness. <laughs> <laughs>
So really, what are your memories of the Malibu Manufacturing? Well, Malibu Manufacturing Company, in my memories of the great memory of it is that all of the girls who used to start working, it was a knitwear factory. Yeah. And it was a huge factory here and there were over a hundred people working for it. So that factory was built here in the 1930s yeah. and it employed mostly girls, which was very important, but quite a few men as well. Mm. So uh, the actual building, this building here that we're just looking at across yeah. here, was where it originally started. That was the original Malibu Manufacturing Company. And the machines were in there, they were hand machines, yeah. hand knitwear machines, which was very hard work. Yeah. So they worked eight hours a day through the week. The men worked at night in the night shifts there. Yeah. And um, it brought an awful lot of money into the town, as you can well imagine, and yeah. employment. So that went on for, it lasted here for almost, I'd say some 1980, it, it went down 60 to 70 years almost, you know. Mm. And um, it was one a terrific employer altogether. They produced thousands of garments for mm. mostly ladies' knitwear. And that was exported and also sent around to Dunn stores and people like this, you know. So that was the main stay of the industry in Milton Melbourne, the Melbourne Knitwear Company. Mm. And then in the mid 50s, the O'Driscoll family who owned the Melbourne Knitwear Company started what we called a woven label company, mm -hmm. which is labels on the garments yeah. at the back here, you see. So you could not export a garment without having a woven label on it. Yeah. So they actually started a woven label company. They built a new factory at the t in, in the late 30s on the far side of this old building. They started a label company here. Mm -hmm. Germans took over in 53 and the Germans built up that business and then they sold it to an English company, the Woven Label side, a company by the name of Beresfuls. Beresfuls got that factory there built, where John O'Dwyer is. Yeah. And in there we had a whole mixture of different type of weaving products. We had labels, ribbon and embroidery. Yeah. And each week we produced out of that factory there millions of yards of ribbon. Mm. We produced enough ribbon, Bellinsworth produced enough ribbon to go around the world actually. Jesus. We worked 365 days a year around the clock mm. in these factories. So I did the Melbourne. Yeah. And uh, all the ribbon was for export and embroidery, plus a lot of the labels like, you know. Yeah. So that is the basics behind the industry in this pocket of industries, which was textiles. And the textile industry was the worst paying industry that could be imagined <laughs> as well. It was a very poor industry, wages wise. Yeah. So Ireland in, from the 30s up to the 80s would be regarded generally around the country as third world yeah. in industry, do you know? Mm -hmm. So Rebecca, that's basically what we're kind of looking at here today, you know? Yeah. The knitwear, knitwear woven labels in this, this area here. Yeah. There was other industry up the road a bit. Mm. But they actually made sails for boats. Oh. And um, one of the sails which they did make was the size of the football ground outside. They had to go out to the football ground to actually make it out there. Mm. Just for the Dutch Navy. But that was a different era again. It followed up from from the collapse of these industries here in, in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. So that's basically my great memories of this was when the sirens just go off at six o'clock in the evening. The massive amount of people who used to come down the hill from work, all these ladies and all. There's another very funny point in it. When work finished in these factories in the 50s and 60s, do you say the rosary before they went home, believe it or not? The workers all go down the knees and say the rosary, then abandon. I can't see that happening in the world of today, but that was a fact. Yeah. But uh, that is the way it was. So it was a great, there were great memories really. Yeah. You know? Now this is the knitting room and those are the knitting machines and they were all operated by men. The machine went over and had them over there and they are pieces. The knitters had to rip them off. There was a little draw thread and stack them up in dozens. They were sent out then to the makeup room where I was working and they were pressed, pre-pressed and cut into garments, shaped and cut in. That particular bloke who worked in the machines became um, 
supervisor and a mechanic eventually. He was a great mechanic, Pat Flynn. Now, this is the makeup room where I was. I was supervising this room, but not at that stage. I was just working machine. That's me there. And I was working with an overlock machine, and we were all in rows like that. And back here was the cutting tables. Uh, this is the pressing machine again, operated by two ladies. Uh, you put the piece in there, you pull down that top on it, and blow the steam up into the, it blew steam and pressed it. This was the winder, and the yarn used to come in in hanks, you can see it there. And it had to be wound into cones so that you could use it on the knitting machines. That's the winder again. You can see there the yarn all around that. And it had to be wound into cones. The cutting room. And there are all the pieces that you had seen off the knitting machines. They are all pre-pressed there and they're cut by a cutting, a cutter. And that cutter could cut six or eight lays together, the height of material together. This is the cutter. That girl was from Nina. She married a local boy. That's Joe Burke's mother, actually. And there she's there cutting. There. If you were brought into the office, there'd be trouble. So that is the office where Noel O'Driscoll and his wife worked. Now, this was the man that was really, at the start, responsible for the woven labels. They are just up there now, and he I have it on screen. And he introduced all that woven. Now, those are the labels. They are just samples of the woven labels that Delcash labels made. And that was the only woven label factory in Ireland, the factory that was in Milltown. That would have been an Irish export stand, what would be Futura Fair now, that would be called or the craft fairs in those days. They used to do it twice a year. And there were, export, there were people brought in from all over the world to shop at these fairs, even back then. And that would have been up in the RDS in those days. In latter days, that would have been, they would have been computerised machines. On this side, this, this was the computerised, they were a Swiss machine, they were made by Jubé of Leicester and Cuvée in Switzerland. When were these machines introduced? They were brought in in 1980. They were supposed to be the making of the factory. They could knit uh, intricate Aran sweaters that were almost as good as a handmade sweater. But again, because just because we had them didn't mean that we could compete with the Chinese who also had them and they could knit an iron sweater far cheaper than yeah. anybody. I remember being in Dunstore's buying office, which at that time was on Stephen Street in Dublin, with a garment that was going to cost £3.65 to produce in Milltown Malbay. And they were able to produce the same garment for 79 pence from China. And this is, this, they had the same machines as we had, but we could never, ever compete. It's a sad thing to say that there isn't a knitwear factory manufacturing in Ireland anymore. And they all tried and they were all there for around the same length of time. All the knitwear companies mm -hmm. in this country lasted about 50 years. But to think that a tradition that we had of knitting, of hand knitting going on to this is just lost forever. Well, over the years as the factory lost money, my father sold the premises to Shannon Development and then leased it back. But it was, it was never profitable.